Go ahead and go tonight to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And I want to just kind of review a few things before we get into John chapter 5. I don't don't know if you've noticed, but uh, we're kind of seeing a theme in the book of John. And it's kind of really, uh, it it appears as you go through the book of John, he's trying to do the same thing with this gospel as he did in 1 John. If you study the book of 1 John, at the end of it, He says, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the Son of God. I think I quoted that partially right. But he wrote it so people would believe. That was the the key. That was the theme, that you must believe God. And as we've been kind of going through these chapters, chapter by chapter, I've kind of been titling all of them, you know, just things about Jesus and things that he is. And... um, Last week, we talked about Jesus Christ, the, anybody remember? See if you're paying attention. What's that? No. I'm, I'm asking you this because I can't remember either. <laughs> but um, I can't remember what it was. Oh, the water of life. The water of, yeah, the water of life, okay? Uh, the, yeah, so the first week was Jesus was God, all right? My God and my Messiah, okay? Now, Here's the thing, too, because, you know, it's interesting because the, yeah, it was the third week I talked about Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father. And I was went back and I listened because I got done with that message. Like, you know, I don't think I explained that very well. And I was thinking about it again. There's been a lot of controversy going around about when it comes to the Trinity. And I got to thinking about that. And I was like, man, I hope nobody thinks that I am one of these, uh, you know, oneness doctrine people like the Pentecostals teach, okay? Because I am not that at all. I absolutely believe in the Trinity, but I, I went back and I listened. I was like, yeah, I did not make that real clear what I meant by calling Jesus the Father. Because if you remember in John chapter 14, okay, the Trinity is a very important doctrine. In fact, um, 1 John is one of the key verses. Uh, in 1 John, it teaches about you know the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And it says these three are one. We get that from 1 John. In John chapter 14, Jesus made the statement, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay? Now, how do we make sense of all these things? Okay? Now, because the, the Trinity, it is kind of a complicated thing, isn't it? I mean, it is, it's something that is difficult to explain. And, you know, I can understand how sometimes people get off on that subject. Okay? But notice, in John chapter 1, we had Jesus, my God, Christ my God, and my Messiah. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Did it not? Okay. In John chapter 2, I forgot what we called him on that one. But in John chapter 3, Heavenly Father, last week we called him the water of life. Okay. Now, all these things that we call Jesus, okay, and when it comes to him being God, why do we say this? Okay. How does this this make sense? Because we're going to call him something else in this passage too. And I think it's next week we're going to be calling him the bread of life. Okay, All these titles that he gives, these are things that we believe about Jesus by faith. Okay? There is no doubt that there are three different offices, you could say, of God. you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. No doubt about it that those are three different things, but the Bible says these three are one too. So how do we make sense of all this? How do we, you know, how do we, how are we supposed to look at this? And I think the best way to explain it is, okay, last week we called Jesus the water of life, did we not? Now, is Jesus water? Okay, well, obviously not, but by faith, we take the water of life when we believe him, don't we? Okay, how, and when when the Bible says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Okay, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. How do we believe in God? Well, we have to believe on him through Jesus Christ, don't we? You can't believe in God and not believe in Jesus. We can't get to God unless we go through Jesus Christ. Okay, when it comes to uh, yeah, you know, the bread of life, you know, Jesus said, unless you got to eat my body. Or are we supposed to eat his body? No, but what we're supposed to do is believe his words. When we believe Jesus, we're believing God. When Jesus said ye must be born again, did he mean we must physically be born again? Obviously not. How can we be reborn? 
Well, we have to have, you know, if, you know, it happens when we get saved. God obviously is the heavenly father, but at the same time, how do we get to the heavenly father? We go through Jesus Christ by believing him. That is how we get there. And so, you know, it is, it's kind of deep stuff. And we'll probably cover a little more of this as we go on here. But said so I, 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 I don't want anybody to think that I'm that way because I'm not. And, but at the same time, I believe in the Heavenly Father. I, I have a Heavenly Father because of Jesus Christ through Him. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what is that? But if, here's the thing. If you, when they were seeing Him, were they seeing God the Father? No, they were seeing God the Son in the flesh. But when you believe Him, okay, that's when... That's when things happen. For example, when we got saved, okay, um, when we received eternal life, did were we handed anything? Did we see anything physically? No. But when we believed him, we got it, didn't we? And we believe that by faith. And we believe that Jesus is God by faith. We believe that he's all those things. We believe that he is the water of life by faith. I haven't seen the water of life that comes from the throne, have I? But you know what? I believe Jesus when he said he's the water of life. And therefore, I have taken of the water of life. I've never eaten the bread, physical heavenly bread or whatever like he was talking about. But I did by faith when I believed on him. And I believe in God and I have not seen the Father. But when I believed on Jesus Christ, I got the Father too. All of it goes through him. And it's all a faith thing, okay? It's all about faith. Everybody's looking for something physical, okay? And that's where the Pentecostals get it wrong too, you know, they're all about this Jesus only thing because it's, I think to them, it's a little easier to believe in Jesus, you know, and make it just about a physical being and not about a spiritual being that's in heaven too. Even when it comes to the Holy Spirit, when they talk about the Holy Spirit, it always has something to do with their works, them speaking in tongues, something that they have seen themselves do. They have no faith. And that's a problem. So uh, hope we might cover more of that as we go through here. But let's start reading in verse 1. There's a lot of stuff I want to cover tonight. But it says in uh, John chapter 5, verse 1, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, and of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Jesus' miracle that he did in this story, like many of his miracles, interestingly enough, it was done on the Sabbath day. And you all know what's going to happen here. You know, there's going to be some problems. But you know what? I believe Jesus did this miracle on the Sabbath day on purpose. Okay, remember, Jesus' miracles always had some kind of spiritual meaning to it. When Jesus would heal somebody, pretty much every example you can find, there's some kind of spiritual lesson he was trying to teach through that healing. What was he trying to teach us when he healed this man who had been who was, you know, crippled for 38 years? Okay, and he noticed once again he did it on the Sabbath day. A time when you're supposed to rest, he tells him to take up his bed and walk, okay? You know, that's work. We see the fair, we're going to see the Pharisees had a problem with that. But think about this. For years, this man had a physical burden. And the truth is, Jesus gave him rest from it on the Sabbath day, didn't he? Imagine what it would be like to not be able to walk for 38 years. That would make things hard, wouldn't it? That would be a difficult thing. Every day, everything would be a difficult task if you're not able to walk for 38 years. And so Jesus healing him on the Sabbath day, I think was giving him rest, wasn't it? I mean, he just made his life a whole lot easier. This is going to be the easiest day this man has ever had. 
Uh, and so, yeah, he told him to take up his bed and walk. But, you know, the purpose of this miracle, it was to show that Jesus could lift the burden of the law off of our lives. Our monthly memory verse, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest under your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I've said it before many times, people, they use that verse and it's like they think that's supposed to mean the Christian life is easy. That's not what that passage is saying. He was saying that uh, after, you know, there was the, all these Jews that are putting all these burdens on people, making salvation hard. And Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy. The way to salvation is easy. You know, the easy believism is under attack right now. And you know what? I'm sorry. Salvation is easy. A lot of people want to work for it. A lot of, want to peop- a lot of people want to do something to prove that they're worthy of it. But you know what? Salvation, it is only by faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. And I'm sorry, you can go ahead and try to do all the works you want and you can prove to everybody that you're better than all of us, but you still won't go to heaven. You got to have faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus was showing when he did that miracle, how he healed this man on the Sabbath day. He gave this man the easiest day he's ever had in his life. And you know what? When we get saved, things have gotten so much easier for us because you know what? We're now no longer in condemnation. We're, we're on our way to heaven. We don't have to try keeping the law in order to be saved anymore. We weren't capable of that. We were in bondage to those things the Bible teaches, but Jesus Christ, He freed us from those things. And so, you know, Jesus, did, He did a great thing here, and I think it was appropriate He did it on the Sabbath day. So look at verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto Him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. The Jews in this story, they did what they, what they always did and what people like them still do today. They attacked the liberty that comes from Christ, didn't they? And that's what, that's what people still do today. When you teach a salvation that's by faith, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's not of works, People will attack that liberty. Oh, you're saying that you know you can you know you can get saved and go do all these things, and they they do you know they attack our liberty that we have. They try to bind us to the things of the law, saying we have to do these things in order to be saved. Or you know the way a lot of Baptists do it, they're not going to go as far as doing that, but they will say you know if you're not doing these laws, then you're not really saved. And then people are always doubting their salvation and wondering if they're really saved. Because, you know, they've got all these people telling them they're not because they're not keeping the laws good enough. And this has been a problem since the time of Christ, and it will always be a problem. And those people, uh, you know, they're just they're going to have to just die and go to hell. I mean, that's what's going to happen to them unless they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's possible this man's problem was a result of a past sin. You know, notice what Jesus said to him because the man, he went into the temple and he said, you know, behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. The Bible doesn't tell us what he did. You know, maybe it was something that happened from the past that caused that to happen to him. But he tells him, you know, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. And, you know, the, the works-based salvation crowd, they will always do everything they can to stop people like us who teach that it's not of works and live like it's not of works okay and once again i don't you know what's funny people who preach like like we do here you know they're they're not the liberal ones when it comes to you know behavior and standards and everything like that i mean you know usually if you know i i I hate to do this all right i speak as a fool right now but you know the crowds like ours that teach the way we do if we're going to go through and start checking off things in the law that we're keeping, I think we usually beat the crowd that teaches it the other way. Oh, that's my opinion. And you know what? It's foolish to even judge that way. But once again, you know, it, 
it really, it really doesn't make any sense. I, I don't see anybody going and encouraging people to go out and sin just because they're saved. But you know what? There is something about doing something because you want to. And it, it's different. You know, it, it is. It's different when people do things because they have to. You know, I, I'm so sick of every time I go into Walmart, they got that one section right when you go in there that's always the holiday stuff, whatever the next holiday is. And no matter what, there's always some holiday coming up and they've got all that stuff that you're supposed to buy. You know, you got all these obligations. They make up these holidays all the time. And then, you know, and then they guilt trip you if you don't do these things. And it's like, you know what? I don't want to be guilt tripped into doing something nice for somebody. I want to do it because I want to do it. But you know what? When you get guilt tripped all the time, it's hard to do it because you want to do it, isn't it? And, you know, don't you hate that? And, you know, and I don't want people to do things for me because they feel like they have to. You know, and you do, you got these people that are out there, you know, Father's Day, we just had Father's Day, you know, and they'll sit around just waiting, you know, my kid's going to do anything, you know, anybody get me anything, is anybody going to remember me on Father's Day? You know, and let me tell you, if you act like that, your kids are going to pick up on it and they're going to start doing things for you on Father's Day because they have to, and it's not going to be any fun. Okay, and same thing on Valentine's Day, made up, you know, sweetest day. What in the world is that all about? I, I made the mistake of doing something nice for my wife on the sweetest day when we were engaged. And I, I got lucky. I heard about it on the radio. She didn't even know about it. And I was like, I'm going to do something nice on sweetest day. And I'm going to score major points because she's not going to be expecting this. And so I did. I gave her an unexpected surprise. I don't remember what it was. It wasn't anything that great. On sweetest day. And it was, it was a big deal. I scored major points. But here was the problem. The next year, I forgot about Sweetest Day. I didn't hear about it on the radio. And it was like she was kind of expecting something. And it's like, you know, and so now it, it, it's, it, you know, I've missed enough of them now. It's no longer an obligation. All right. But <laughs> at the same time, all right, you know, women, don't do that to your husbands. All right. You know, otherwise they're going to be doing these things for all the wrong reasons. And you do, you've got these people out there. That's what they do when you start telling people, you know, if you don't do these things, you're not really saved. Or you have to do these things to be saved. People are now are going to be serving God for all the wrong reasons. They're not going to be doing it from the heart. They're not going to be walking in the spirit. It's not going to be any fun. But you know what? When we know that my salvation has nothing to do with my works, that keeping my salvation has nothing to do with my performance as a Christian, I am now free to serve God from the heart because I want to. And I love that liberty that we have in Christ. And that's the way God wants it. And these people, there are, they're trying to entangle us again in the yoke of bondage. And they need to go jump in a lake. That's wicked. We're not going to get caught up into that stuff. But look at verse 17. It says, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. For the father loveth the son and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Okay, right. Jesus, he was able to work on the Sabbath day because he was Lord of the Sabbath. We see that he mentioned that um, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 8. You know, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Okay, because Jesus was God, he, had, he did have that authority. Okay, he did, uh, you know, they, you know what, when he said, you know, I'm the Son, so it makes him equal with God and... You know, these things were true that he was saying. And therefore, Jesus was not breaking any law when he healed that man on the Sabbath. And he told him to take up his bed and walk. He had that authority. Okay. Now, here's where I hope I can make this clear. Okay. I'm going to be getting, maybe getting a little deep here. But once again, when it comes back to the Trinity, all right, when it comes back to the Father and the Son, okay, Jesus said, he told that man to take up his bed and walk. Jesus had the authority to do that. Okay? But how do we know Jesus had the authority to do that? Well, we know because we believe his words. We, be we believe him. 
the Jews, they could not, they would not believe him. All they could do was look at the letter of the law. Okay? They had no faith. And therefore, they did not, they did not believe him. And, you know, that, that's what got them in trouble. So when Jesus says, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, now how does that, you know, line up? Because we do, we see the distinct, you know, different distinctions of the three. You know, these three are one. You know, how, how do we do that? Well, you know what? That's where faith comes in. You know what? I'm going to believe his words. I'm going to believe what he said. Okay? God is, God the Father, the whole time Jesus is on earth, he's in, God's in heaven, isn't he? Okay? And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, God's in heaven, and Jesus is here on earth, and he's saying this. And so it's like, well, we, were those people able to see God in heaven? No. But when they believe Jesus' words, you know, that's what counts for righteousness. When you believe God. And so, you know, we don't always, we don't have to understand every little thing. Okay? When it comes to the promises that God made, we don't have to understand every little thing. And he, notice what he tells him here. He says, I'm going, to do, I'm going to show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Okay? You really want to see something? Well, he's about to show them something. He's about to mention something to them that once again, I can't totally explain this. I don't totally get this. I don't totally understand it. But you know what? I believe it. I believe, I believe it because Jesus said it. And so look at what he says in verse 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. They honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus just told them here. He said, you know what? He said, I'm going to show you greater works that you may marvel. And he says, as the father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the son quickeneth whom he will. Now, what is he talking about here? Okay, and I hope, I hope I have time to get through all of this. But one thing we forget sometimes, okay, is when it, especially when it comes to the rapture. Okay, one thing, that we, and there's some scriptures that people struggle with because I think we forget, to, we forget about some things in the Old Testament that we're supposed to remember. I've said it before. You know, you're supposed to finish grade school before you go into high school, all right? You've got, you can say the Old Testament's grade school and then New Testament's high school, all right? But if you don't, if you don't know what's in the grade school, you're going to struggle in high school, aren't you? And there's a lot of things that people know about in the New Testament, especially concerning the rapture, but they're getting it wrong because they don't understand the Old Testament. And I'm going to, and one thing that is very clear in the Bible, when it, first of all, the rapture, okay? We all know about what the rapture is. But it should not be called the rapture, okay? Not just because that's not a Bible word, but because we've called it the rapture, it's caused people to miss some things about that event that we call the rapture. And people ha uh, have not, there's verses in the Old Testament that are about that event, but people refuse to acknowledge it's about that event because it wasn't called that event in the Old Testament. It was called the resurrection. That's what it was called. And when Jesus said, as the Father raiseth up the dead, these people knew that a day was coming where God was going to raise the dead. They knew that day was coming. And Jesus is saying, just like the Father raised up the dead, the Son is going to quicken whom He will. Now, what does that mean? What's that talking about? When are we quickened? When we get saved, right? That's what, in Ephesians 2. And you hath He quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Now, that's what, that's what the Bible teaches. When we got saved, we got spiritually raised from the dead. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know it by faith. Okay? We don't know it because we spoke in tongues and had some, you know, filling of the Holy Spirit like the Pentecostals teach. No, we know it by faith in the Word of God. We, we know that we have been resurrected. And Jesus said He's going to resurrect whom He will. Well, who, 
does he will will be resurrected? Those who believe. Okay, that's very clear all over the Bible. And we should not marvel at this because look at this. It says in um, 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Now, is that talking about the resurrection of the future? Or is that talking about something else? I believe when he says that there, he's actually talking about in that present time because he says the hour is coming and now is. When the dead shall hear. Well, who are the dead? Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. And when we hear God's words, we believe on him, we will live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Now, is this a future event? It, this is a future event, that time when all who are in the graves will hear his voice. It says, I uh, lost my spot. Where am I? Verse 20, oh, 9. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So right there, Jesus mentions the resurrection, and I believe he's talking about the rapture right there. Okay? Now, we're going to see though there those that one what that one verse there that explains all of that as one event, they actually happen at two different times though. And I'll show you that real clear here in just a minute, but one thing I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but one thing that we see back in these passages where it talks about Jesus raising those from the dead. He says he, he was going to raise whoever he will. He said, God, and note, he says, for the father judgeth no man, in verse 22, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. People talk about the difference. You know, I heard a guy tell me one time, the God of the Old Testament is not the same God that's in the New Testament. You know, God the father was all, you know, all about, you know, killing everybody. You know, Jesus Christ was all about love. Why do we see the big difference? The guy said God's kind of schizophrenic, it looks like. You know, kind of blasphemous right there. But listen, there's a reason there is a big difference, okay? God is just. God is holy. God has to deal with sin. So why do we see such a big difference in the New Testament? Well, because God committed all judgment to the Son, and Jesus paid for all sins, didn't He? Therefore, He doesn't have to pour out his wrath on us all the time when we sin. God does not have to pour out his wrath on America right now, even though we deserve it. Why? Because Jesus paid for all sins. But the time is coming after the resurrection, after the rapture, where all those who did not do what Christ willed, all those who did not believe, they will suffer the wrath of God. And all of a sudden, we are going to see... Jesus Christ looking a lot like he did in the Old Testament, aren't we? In fact, you could say it's going to be a whole lot worse than it was. I don't know what these, you know, smiley Joel Osteen, you know, all God is love preachers are going to say during that time. Because it's, it's going to get really ugly during that time. But God feels the same way about sin today that he did in the Old Testament. But he is able to be forgiving and merciful because he paid for our sins. But those who reject him, their time is coming. And Jesus, so he has, he has the ability to forgive because he paid for our sins. And Jesus will only forgive those who believe. And there is a limited window of opportunity for men to do that. After this event, the rapture, time's up. You know, it, it's, it's over. After that window is closed, we will see Jesus Christ showing himself as the God of the Old Testament. And it's going to be worse than ever. So Jesus. He's revealing in these next verses, 25 through 27, that he has the ability to resurrect people spiritually. That is what happens when we got saved. Okay, If you don't believe Jesus can resurrect people spiritually, you're not saved. Okay, Because that's exactly what he's doing when, he, when we ask him to save us. Okay, And that's why I get frustrated when I'm out knocking doors and I talk to all these people and they think they're saved because they had this near-death experience and they prayed and Jesus saved them from their near-death experience. Listen, that's not what salvation is. Okay, It's about raising you from the dead spiritually. 
Okay, there's doctors that have brought people back from flatlining that didn't make them get saved. Okay, that's a physical resurrection. You need a spiritual resurrection in order to be saved. And until they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they they're not going to be they're not going to be saved. They're not going to be spiritually resurrected. And so Jesus was revealing that, and Jesus told him not to marvel at that. Don't marvel that I am saying that I can raise you from the dead spiritually because they knew. They knew about this. Okay, The Sadducees didn't believe it, but the Pharisees even believed in this, that God was going to physically resurrect the dead one day. Don't marvel at this. You all know about this event. You all know about the day that's coming where all that are in the graves are going to hear the voice and they're going to come forth. All of them. That's what, that's what he said. And so God, saying, you know, he's saying, don't be surprised that right now I can resurrect you spiritually. And so let's look at some verses on the resurrection. Because look, look at Daniel chapter 12 first. I believe when Jesus uh, in verse 29, uh, 28 and 29, I believe he's, this is a reference to Daniel chapter 12. It says in Daniel chapter 12, and at that time, what time? The time after the Antichrist has been wearing out the saints that we read about in chapter 9, 10, and 11. After the tribulation, after, uh, during, it's at that time, after the abomination of desolation, shall Michael stand up, the great prince, prince would stand it for the children of the people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt. Notice that there. It looks like one resurrection too, doesn't it? It looks like it happens at the same time. People say, that's not, the that's not the rapture. Because look, you got those rising to everlasting shame and contempt. That's not the rapture in John chapter 5. Because you have those who are rising, you know, uh, how, did, how did it say it there? Uh, though, unto the resurrection of damnation. You know, they don't rise at the rapture like we do. But understand, in the Old Testament, they knew about a resurrection. They knew that day was coming. They knew a day it was coming where everyone was going to come back to life. Acts 23, verse 6, But when the, uh, Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the, and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. What was he talking about? That, that event that they knew about. The Sadducees didn't believe in it. And when Paul said that, the Pharisees and Sadducees all started arguing. But they did. They knew about that event, the resurrection of the dead. And uh, in verse 20, or John, uh, Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. He knew he was going to resurrect one day. He knew that day was coming. Way back in Job. Job, they believe, was around the time of Abraham. They knew about a resurrection. Isaiah 26, 19. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise? Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the... Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Uh, right there, another example. Rapture or the resurrection and then God pours his wrath out. Hey, just like we teach. Um, John eleven twenty four. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again, talking about Lazarus, in the resurrection at the last day. Show it. They knew, they knew about this. 2 Timothy 2.16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their words will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying, the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. They're, these guys were saying, hey, this already happened. These were the preterists. They were even around back in that day. Saying, oh, no, rapture already happened. Hebrews 6.2, Of the doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Luke 20, 27, then came certain of the Sadducees which deny there is any resurrection. And then they asked him that question about the woman who is married, all the different men, whose wife was she going to be? In verse 33, Jesus said, therefore in the resurrection, 
Whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answered, said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they that should be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. So, and uh, neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So right there we see all those verses about the resurrection of the dead. And... The pre-tribbers, they're going to tell you, they're, they're going to have to say, if you start showing them all those verses, that no, that's not talking about the rapture. Because, you know, in some of those passages, notice it mentions the lost in there too. They don't rise when we do. No, you're right. They don't rise when we do. And that's why it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ shall rise first. A lot of people think, and, and you know, I, you know it's, I guess I can say that's my opinion. A lot of people think when it says the dead in Christ will rise first, meaning you know, they're going to rise and then we will be caught up together with them in the clouds. But I think he mentions the dead in Christ rising first because they rise before the rest of the dead. And that's not clear enough? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 20. In verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Y'all see that? The rest of it, they don't live until the thousand years are finished. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And notice too who these people are. They're the ones who were beheaded because they wouldn't take the mark. So that was during the tribulation and they resurrected at the rapture. That happens, after, that happens right after the tribulation. and But the rest of the dead, they don't live until the thousand years are over. Verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil dece that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they should be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Y'all see that? Small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell were delivered up, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. You all see that? It's very clear that the resurrection of the rest of the dead happens after the millennium. And so I personally believe the dead in Christ rising first is a reference to the saved. They rise before the lost. Because all the Old Testament saints, they knew about the resurrection of the dead and it kind of looked like it was at the same time. But we learn in the New Testament that the dead in Christ rise first and the rest of the dead they don't live again until the thousand years are finished. And so that, uh, that, that's what I believe about that. But Jesus, and so Jesus was saying, you know, that day was coming. And I do believe what he mentioned there in uh, John chapter 5, that resurrection, I believe that is the event that people call the rapture. That, that we probably should have stuck with the resurrection. That would, that would have been better. Because think about most believers... The vast majority of the believers that have ever been, they're going to resurrect, aren't they? Now, we which are alive and remain, we'll be caught up together with them. We're going to get to go up too. But at the same time, 
for the vast majority of the saved, it will be a physical resurrection, won't it? And there will be some of us who will not see death, and I hope I'm one of those people. But so um, Jesus told them, though, you know, not to marvel because they knew God was going to physically resurrect the dead. And so they shouldn't have been shocked since they knew God had the ability to do that. They should have believed that Jesus had the ability to save their souls and to resurrect them spiritually. And so, uh, in the rest of the, go ahead, uh, verse 30, we're going to read the rest of this passage. It says, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures are what testify of Jesus Christ. They should have known that they should believe Jesus because of what the Scriptures said. Everything Jesus did and said lined up with the Scriptures. Every, everything. Verse 40, And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. I believe that's a reference to them accepting the Antichrist. And they will do that. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Right, let me tell you, don't ever let anybody get away with telling you that the Jews believe the Old Testament, just not the New Testament. No, Jesus said if you'll believe Moses... You'll believe me because he spoke of me. Okay, that is a lie when people say that. They do not believe the Old Testament. If they did, they would believe Jesus Christ. But I, I titled this chapter, Jesus Christ, the Righteous Judge. Because notice how he mentions how God gave all judgment to him. He was going to judge. Notice how it says too, that you know, don't think I won't accuse you to the Father. Those who do not believe in Christ, they have no excuse for not believing in him. None whatsoever. And judgment is going to come on those people. Every, every one of those people. And the thing is, when it comes to getting saved, okay, he did, he did all these things so they might be saved. He, did the, he d would do these miracles so they would believe him. So they would have faith because that's what you have to do to be saved. And we see here very clearly that Jesus is you know, showing the role that he has and the role God has. And we see that God gave all judgment to the Son. But you know what? The day is going to come where Jesus is going to give it all back to the Father. And you know what? This is just my personal opinion. But we, meant, we talked about, uh, we read through Revelation chapter 20, and it talks about Satan being loosed out of his pit for a little season. He's going to go deceive the nations again. And you know what I think? This is my opinion. This is, what I, this is how I think the devil is going to deceive the nations. This is what I think the devil's going to use. This is my own personal opinion. But one, in order to be saved, you have to have faith, don't you? You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if Jesus is on earth ruling and reigning, then where's the faith? Okay. Now, the dispensations will tell you it's because you're going to get saved different in the millennium. No, it, it, we've never been saved any way other than by grace through faith. And it will be the same thing during the millennium. But you know what I personally believe? I believe that one of the things that Satan's going to do, the way he's going to deceive, is he's going to tell people Jesus isn't really the Father. Or Jesus isn't really God. Because at this point, no one has seen God yet. We've seen Jesus. 
but we've not seen God. And after the millennium, Jesus is going to deliver the kingdom up to God. And it says there at the end of Revelations that we will see his face. But that's not until after the millennium. We will not see God, the Father, until the millennium. So what does that mean? Well, I personally, be- I personally believe you know, the devil's probably going to try to spin a lie that Jesus isn't really God. You know, where's proof? Have, have you seen God yet? You know, they will have seen Jesus Christ. And you and I know if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. If you believe on him, you believe in the Father. But you know what? I think Satan, he'll probably fool everybody and tell them that's not really God there. You know, that's not, re- that's not really who he is. And they're going to want to see God. No, we want to see God. And that's how a lot of people are today. No, I want the proof. Sorry, you got to have faith. And these people, are, no, we want to see God the Father. And Jesus is like, no, you believe me. You follow, you follow me. You're not going to get to the Father except through me. And once again, people will be deceived. And those people are going to end up being cast in the lake of fire. And then after that, Jesus Christ, he's going to deliver the kingdom up to the Father. And we're going to get to see his face. And, you know, so some of this stuff, it is, it's kind of, it is, it's pretty deep. It's something to ponder. But here's the thing. If we could fully understand God, would that be much of a God? You know, I forgot what that verse is that said, you know, there's that day coming where we will know him as we are known of him. You know, there, there is a lot more to be revealed about God than what we, just what we know. A lot more to come. Well, how are we going to get that? I want that information. I want that information right now. I want to see God now. I want to know God now. Well, if you want to know God, if you ever want to see God, you're going to have to go through Jesus Christ. You've got to believe Him right now. You've got to have faith right now. If you want the Father, you don't get the Father unless you go through Jesus Christ. We pray to God in Jesus name. And so, you know, the world today, you know, it's it's all about finding unity, but they refuse to unite with God's word. And it's because they can't because they are not of God. As believers, we need to make sure we don't ever get caught up in this ecumenicalism and uniting with evil. Our main responsi- responsibility is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's what that's what God wants us to do. That's what God wants us to do. That is what is expected of us. We just need to fear God, keep his commandments. You know, we like Paul, our goal ought to be able to say, you know, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Just sit down and think sometime about how many things that we claim as fact, but we have not seen anything physically. But we believe these things by faith. We've not seen the Father. Well, we can have the Father through Jesus Christ. We've not drank any water, you know, that gives eternal life, physically speaking, but we have by faith when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've not eaten any physical water bread that gives eternal life but we did spiritually when we had faith in jesus christ those who have had faith according to god have done all those things well where's the proof i can't see anything well you don't get to see you're just going to have to believe how can god and jesus be one Uh, you don't get to see that you're just supposed to believe that and the day will come where you'll you'll see how it all works and you'll understand all that, but you, you just got to believe. You believe God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are all separate? Yes. Why? Because the Bible says, you know, they are. Do you believe they're all one too? Yep. Because the Bible says they're one. You know, do I, do I understand everything about it? No, but I believe it. Just like I believe I'm saved. I got nothing physical I can show you. I've only got, hey, this is what the Bible says. And by faith... I believe I'm saved. I believe I'm on my way to heaven. I believe there's a heaven. I believe there's a hell. I believe all those things by faith. And throughout the book of John, that's what it's all about. Believe him. Believe his words. Jesus, what he gives some dark sayings sometimes. Like, man, what is he talking about? He's trying trying to get these people to have faith 
and believe Him and trust Him. And if we'll do that, we will get all those things. I believe one of these days, I will literally drink water from the uh, stream that comes from the throne. I believe I'll do that one of these days. But at the same time, I've already done it, haven't I? Because I trusted in Jesus Christ. Show me the proof. I don't have any proof. I just have my faith. And that's, that's what Paul, I determined not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, you confess Christ. That's the important thing. And we do. You know, a lot of people too, you know, a lot of religions, they claim God, but they don't want to claim Jesus Christ. Well, if you don't, you don't get, you don't get the Father unless you go through Jesus Christ. He is the only way. We have to believe him. He gave everything, all judgment to the Son, and it was Jesus, it was His will that we would believe. And so, deep stuff, but I hope that was clear. Uh, I, I hope that was helpful. And so, with that, let's all stand together.